Welcome to Podcast IRC, conversations with Indigenous scholars to advance understandings and gain new knowledge, hosted by the Indigenous Research Centre at Salish Kootenai College. particular song <clears throat> was a, is a song that's still being used today, but that particular song was recorded in 1909 at Crow Agency, and that was for the uh, Wanamaker, Wanamaker Expedition uh, to the North American Indian. But it, uh, that song, uh, the, the Brave Dog Society, our Crazy Dog Society, two different things, two different societies, but the same use that particular song for uh, victory. But there was, in uh, and, and the last podcast, we talked about White Dog. And this, this is the song that, that, uh, that is rendered on, on that occasion for that occasion that happened. And I was thinking about this particular song and songs and in general. And this was about, what, 1909. It's not that long ago, really. And you, you think mm-hmm. about the concept of the United States being about 240 years old. It's really not that long ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we have to realize that these, these ways have been here uh, way before Christianity was developed or created 2,020 years ago. Science has, uh-huh. has documented uh, our people being here. Uh, about 12,000 plus years ago. And science is basically good observation, right? And we've had all these years to observe the the landscape and the environment. And you listen to origin stories from Blackfoot people or or, uh, Nez Perce people or Kootenai people or Crow. And they tell a story about where they came from and how they came about and the environment that they that they existed in created their language and created their ways. But I was just thinking about mm-hmm. the song in in how song validates uh, people, places, or events, such as what was being sung or being recorded. Then it was it was depicting a time when when that Sioux chief came and in those black those Pikani people uh, warriors grabbed him and they didn't kill him. Yeah. They didn't kill him. They drug him around the camp. And my grandfather, great grandfather was in that uh, camp and was told that he, he was, he was one of the young kids that touched him like a coup story, like a coup. So our family has that uh, story. And then again, meeting white dogs, great, great grandson and those two songs meeting but going even further, the song that validates that, and, and we think about uh, Western society and how right now we're in Western society thinking and we're, we're building capacity for Western society. But the capacity for Native thinking has always been here, and it's been here longer than any other uh, conceptual worldview. And we're really not yeah. looking at that in a scholarly way and, and with your indigenous research center, it's giving us that opportunity to talk about our ways. And we talked about, um, yeah. Last time we talked about who cares. I mean, the average Joe American doesn't really care about this kind of history, but in this group that's attending this podcast, that's on this podcast, they do care about that because that's our history. That's our 
yeah our our way of of thinking in that dichotomy of 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 those two different worldviews coming together and conflicting so you you would say you probably the american would say well what about it well there's a lot of uh there's a mm-hmm. lot of intellectual merit in the broader impact of that could tell you volumes about our environment it could tell you volumes about uh healing i mean this particular mm-hmm. song is 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 talking about the event but songs in general from my experience they're the key that opens up that door to that other side that we don't talk about with our five senses and that other yeah. sense that's out there you can open that up my uh my aunt gertie my aunt gertie heavy runner she said when we all gather at these ceremonies our doings our happenings we focus all of our attention on that person who's asking for help and those songs help yeah. us help us to to get there so songs are really really important and uh this particular song just be happen happening to be there and it tells about an event but it's also used to to recreate some of our society origin stories, such as the brave dog and the crazy dog, which are two different societies. They have two different origin stories, but they, they, their capacity is the same for our camps and our, our ways. So. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Um, you know, to be able to, to step back into time, you know, like that, even if it's just, you know, hundred, 110 years ago, you know, we, we, like I, I think I mentioned before, we're always looking into the past for, for guidance, for things that we need to do today. And, you know, as we all know, our, our world's really, you know, kind of upside down the way that our, our ancestors lived even, even 50 years ago, even 30 years ago for that matter, in, in some instances. And, um, you know, the challenge that I see in in all of this you know number one is really promoting the importance of songs Mm -hmm. as as the things that you've all you've already mentioned and that we've talked about before how they're they're a particular connection to to things that are are unseen Um, but they really are markers and they're um, records of of occasions and events and they're uh, i think wholly underutilized today by native people in the, in a traditional sense. So right. the biggest challenge I see with, with doing all of that is how, how do we, how do we make it, how do we make it part of our, our daily routine and not like you said last in the podcast, not just after five. Right. Right. So kind of getting even more deeper into that process of, of transfer and validating you know, when you go to uh, get your driver's license, you go down to the uh, driver's license place and you give that lady or the dude 40 bucks and you say, I want a license. They'll give you a test. And yeah. if you pass with 80 percent or better on both of those tests, they'll give you a little card with all your vital statistics mm. and your picture. And that's the physical documentation mm. of permission to give you permission to drive in the state of Montana. Yeah. So the question I have is who, yeah. give, who give the state of Montana the right for them to give us the right. So going to mm. a Blackfoot Picani ideology. And if you wanted to have that same process, you could say, how can I join the society of drivers? Well, that society over there, they'll give you the rights if you approach them and you go say, Hey, yeah. I want to, uh, I want to be a part of your society. And they would say, okay, well, pay the, there's the payment form format and the economy of that time. And we're talking about in, in our past, maybe a horse or a gun or some hides, the economy of that time would yeah. dictate what was uh, appropriate. And once you did that, they say, okay, you are now a part of our society. We're going to give you this song. And if you ever get stopped out there, you can sing that song. So when you go out Mm. and you're not a part of that society and you sing that song, the society of police come by and say, hey, look, you're not supposed to be driving this way. 
And you could say, well, I'm a part of that uh. driver society and here's my song. And those police will say, well, I'm going to go back and tell them you sang this song. And that's part of mm. the, uh, the truthing process of our, of transfer Yeah, is that uh, if you lie, it's going to be on you and you'll be dealt with just like maybe the courts would deal with you if you didn't have a license in Western thinking. Yeah. So those, yeah. those processes, I can match those up that way from a Blackfoot Bikani perspective and a, and a Western society perspective. Mm-hmm. And a lot of students get that. They, they understand that process. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a good teaching tool to have if you could take some of the framework out of our, our ways and, and juxtapose it to Western society. Sometimes it matches up and sometimes mm. it doesn't. So. Yeah. 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 That's uh that's a really, really good comparison to uh, you know, the function of those songs and um, really the, one of the questions I guess that arises and the one thing I think about, and, and I mentioned it previously in a, one of our dis- discussions was, you know, um, the deeds that are uh, accomplished today, how do we equate those uh, respectfully or uh, comparably to um, uh, to what would merit the singing or the transfer of uh, of uh, of those songs? Mm-hmm. That's kind of what um, you know. There's a lot of things that ha- would have to be. Uh, would have to occur first, you know, number one, we have a a very small pool of people who understand and know songs and music in that context. And then uh, uh, number two, you know, in the modern times, how do we, how do we apply that to, uh, to events that doesn't cheapen it, you know, because if you think about in the olden times, uh, going off to battle and surviving or touching your enemy, that's life and death kind of stuff. That's not really what mm-hmm. we deal with today, unless you, unless you're talking about surviving a, a mm-hmm. drive down ninety three. You know, <laughs> sure. you know, it's a uh, it's just one of those things. You know, how how do you uh, how do we equate that w- while maintaining the integrity of that process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd like to know what anybody else thinks. Everybody's pretty quiet there. Yeah, I feel Aaron, like I'm, I'm hogging up all the us? airtime here. Yeah. Brenda, you with us? Maybe it's just me and you. Sure. <laughs> sure. That was on. a good story. I was listening. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's kind of kind of fell asleep. We must have you know, got uh, boring. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That happens in class yeah, yeah. sometimes though. I like just heard dri- I heard driver's license and then I was like, oh, I got to renew my driver's license. Yeah. And then yeah. I started. Then I <laughs> yeah. looked looked to see when the DMV is open. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> You're riding dirty, friend. So, you better get that renewed. <laughs> so going going back to dirty. that going back to that song that was recorded. The first part of that song was a praise praising song that that. Uh, what you would do is sing that song and in the break you would announce their name and maybe talk about some of the deeds they mm. did in front of everybody. And then that second song that played the second part of that was the actual song of that event. So praising songs mm. are, are used um, in our, in our society. And I know Crow has that way. And I've, I've seen other tribes have that way where they would sing a song to praise somebody. Or uh, another way I seen down in the Crow area is that they would say, hey, I want that way. I'll buy it from you. How that how that happens down there in that instance is the same principle and process that would happen in our ways, too. If somebody liked it or wanted it, they would approach them and say, hey, I want to make that mine. And you would go through the yeah. process. And in our process, you would need a venue. Yeah. You would need a... Uh, you would need language, you would need um, yeah. song and action. So those are the four things you would need mm. for that transfer to take place. And if you juxtapose that mm. with Western society, uh, school, you'd have a place, yeah. you have a classroom. Your action would be, well, 
your your syllabus and everything that's laid out. The language would be the specifics of that syllabus and the outcomes. And then the validation yeah. would be the, the grade, right? Uh, or the song in our case. So those types of things, yeah. uh, that's how we would learn uh, from our environment was through those processes yeah. and to attain power. But it's, it's, it's formal and informal yeah. in those ways. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I can see all that and how that would work. It's it's just the one thing I wrestle with is, um, how, how, how do I, how do I, what's a, what's a comparable deed today as was 200 years ago. And I've had discussions about this. Right. And if you, if you, if you look at the hierarchy of, of, of the deeds of the past, you know, Defeating the enemy in hand-to-hand combat was, you know, one of the top ones. Well, and then, you know, yeah, go ahead. Those still exist. Yeah. See, well, tell well, me. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. So, like, the fight you got in high school, no. <laughs> you could count that as your deed. No, no. <laughs> no, no. You no, would have no. had to give a song away for that fight in high school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm talking. So I ran away from the cops once. Does that count? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> well, tell me. I want to know. Well, I, it just—I don't even. It just brought up, you know, when people say like, uh, with education, we're modern warriors, and and then I, I always I'm kind of uncomfortable with that statement when people say that to me because people will say like, yeah. He, oh, you got your degrees, you know, it's like the you're a modern warrior. And I'm like, well, uh, no, because there's still people who go to war. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's that still a testable feat and uh, still there's still the collection of deeds. Uh, so I, I get real uncomfortable with that. I know when people use that to me, to me, and I, and I can't speak for everybody, so... I just, I think when you say, well, what's a comparable deed? I think we have to acknowledge that the comparable deed is still that deed. So looking, so looking at that, when you were going to war, you were, you were coming into some kind of danger by approaching the enemy into an enemy camp or and maybe not the, that's not the word enemy, but uh, another camp that you wanted to take a horse or a gun or women or whatever it was at that time. And then, uh, yeah, today you're still trying to escape some kind of danger is the meaning of, of that coup coup story. You're trying to escape danger safely. And I'll give a story. I won't say his name or, but one story from an elder up North, they talked about one coup story. They had dinner with the queen because that's they're under the queen's rule. And they took some silverware from the queen's uh, cutlery and used that as a coup because they got out of there safely with it, right? So it was kind of a funny story, but they didn't get caught. And it's, it's not necessarily about stealing. It's just about escaping some kind of danger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I, yeah. Escaping danger. So well, like, we have a, I know there was a song composed for a lady in the early 1900s, which is Selena's in-laws. Um, they were having a, a, a reenactment, what they call a sham battle, like a mock battle. Yeah. And, and yeah. there was a kind of what a, seemed to be like a race right horse race during this battle and she won and they composed a song for her for her feet and she was riding a gray horse in this in this mock battle and so in the song it says the person who was successful was riding a gray horse and people still sing this sing this song for victory so when people come home from battle they'll sing this song but it was really made for this lady but that's not a, it wasn't in battle, but in that instance, it was enough for people to see that as something of value, even success in a mock battle, you know? Ah, I see. I see. 
Yeah. So then, um, you know, if we if we if we uh, think of that in that way, is would graduating high school be a worthy deed? Graduating college would that be a worthy deed? Well, I think it's a, their deeds, their accomplishments, yeah. but are they on the level of composing songs for you or singing these songs for you? And I think um, one way to show success in any deed is irreg- irregularity too, right? Things that don't happen as much, and then you prove that you can do it, so you stand out, right? So like, yeah, so but I'm also not the authority on this, so I don't know what the hell I'm talking well, about. Yeah, well, who, who is? <laughs> who is? Mm-hmm. Someone needs. We want to know. Someone needs to jump in here now and say, <laughs> yeah. "I'm in the weeds here, man." Yeah. No, no, it makes sense though because if you think about it, you know how many how many young native people graduate from high school? A lot, but you know what if the, the circumstances? A while ago, were, that wasn't the case. There wasn't many native students graduating. Now there's a there's a lot of people graduating, not with bachelors or masters. Now there's doctoral, such as uh, we have some yeah. you and Selena. I think Marty, right? Yeah. Kamiya, I'm working on it. Cool. No, not me. See, so so you know those are those are feats that not a lot of native people have, but now there are, and that's great. That's awesome. So maybe we have to raise the bar for coup stories. I don't know. To get a song made for you. It's tough to say because I think it's it's yeah. a group thing. I think, uh, well, and then, you know, okay, so here's the next question. What if you've done something uh, uh, well enough, worthy enough for someone to say, we're going to have a song composed for you. Okay, so now who's going to do that? That's a whole, now you're going into a whole nother skill. So I think ultimately the people who will compose songs for people's success have to be the people who sing. You're still subject to the people who control that occupation. So, um, yeah. Um, you want a song about this person? Well, then you have to go. So then that's a whole nother skill set. That's a different thing now. So, yeah, now we're into that. Yeah, but what? Okay, so then I, this is this this idea of then who has the right to do that? Who has the right to compose a song for another person? Who has the right to um, seek, even seek it or whatever? And so, what does that mean? What does right mean? Yeah, I'm asking the group right now. What did? <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to know. know. I want to know Dude, from. I want to know from. Uh, from our our what our visiting scholars Dude, think. Does, what is that? You, you guys aren't the audience. You need to jump in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Come on, jump on in. So you guys are graduates of U of M. Selena, Marty, Sean Dean, Aaron. Who give the University of Montana the right to give you that doctorate or that degree? Exactly. <laughs> the accreditation board, probably. And who are they? I don't know what the accreditation. Yeah, I have no idea. Some entity that's above. <laughs> I have no idea. I think that's why I'm really hesitant to even speak on this whole, um, not only the songs, but the right. Because I don't, it, I'm not saying we shouldn't speak on it. I just am hesitant because I know that there's a process behind each of these things. And it's hard to, to bring any type of um I don't want to say anything wrong right I don't want to offend people that do have the right to make these songs and to sing these songs um and to give that right and so it's hard to it's I'm having this conversation in my head where like we have to have these conversations because if we don't then how then we'll we'll lose them but I'm also like yeah. but what yeah. what do I have to contribute to this cuz I don't really you know like I don't have the the understanding of what goes into all of this. And so for me, it's just like trying to take in all the stories and, and sit back and think about 
really think about it. Um, but what I do want to say is that last week I was talk to, talking to Janine Pease. She serves on my um, dissertation committee. And I had a finding in there that said um, loss of culture. And she she didn't say that I should change it, but she gave me all of these, um, all of this evidence that we aren't losing our culture. Our culture is very much alive. And one of the things she said to me was, you know, our culture, it's evolving. It evolves with the times. And I hadn't ever really heard that before, or maybe I had, and I just didn't have anything to apply it to. And so in thinking about this question, I'm also thinking about what Janine said to me. And yeah, I might not have the right to give anything away or even really understand that process. But I also, I, I, what I do have the right to do is learn about it and, and make sure that we do talk about it so that, you know, so that it doesn't go away. So those are all my, that's my whole conversation that was going on in my own head. Now I'm embarrassed, but that's what's <laughs> happening over here. <laughs> Selena had her own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody was invited, though. Sorry. <laughs> Marty, take it away. <laughs> See, you shouldn't give me the floor because then I don't shut up. <laughs> oh, no, I have a way to loop it back around here. Okay, uh, awesome. Thanks, Selena Marty. was saying and bringing up a really good point that culture is evolving. And so... And we learned that in school. In anthropology, we learned that cultures do go through this these phases of evolution. It's just it's just natural, of course. But um, so for me, when I've when you guys were talking about these kind of praise songs and and who has the right to um, create these songs, the only well, not the only one, but a lot of something that I've experienced a lot of is. Um, when like high school basketball teams from the reses do something good, there's oftentimes people who go down there with the team and sing for them a song. And it's like they're carrying on this tradition. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it is this this kind of same tradition of singing a song in praise of somebody's good deeds. And when these um, native teams wins like state championships or something, you'll see that. So um, I just wanted to maybe point that out as kind of how the cultures are evolving. And you'll see it with basketball. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's why we love basketball is it's it's kind of taken on a it, it has taken on a big part of our culture to see our young people succeed and 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 ha and um, witness good deeds like everybody's there to see it nobody can refute it and I know that's come up a lot is um, who cares if you say you did something good it it only matters if people were there to see it and people are there to now say, yeah, I saw that happen. That person really did do something good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like, uh, I like the, uh, the, um, the speech that Aaron gives about culture and maybe he can, uh, help to, um, facilitate that understanding by tell us, by telling us what his understanding of the word culture is. Can you do that for us, Aaron? And it's not the reggae band. Hey, man, culture yeah. culture as a reggae band is classic. <laughs> oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. Culture yeah. club? Roots. Roots. Not culture, culture club. club. <laughs> not a culture club. Uh, nothing wrong with that if that's your style, but uh, we don't confuse culture, the Roots reggae band, with culture club. The Boy okay. George pop sensation <laughs> of oh, the God. 80s. Yes. Oh, God. <clears throat> No, yes. I, I think I mean Marty was sitting right in there in those classes with me when 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 my mind was blown because growing up in Indian country you always kind of like hold culture like it's this thing like you have it in your toolbox or it's in your closet and you're like in fact some people actually have a closet that has stuff in it that's culturally related no <laughs> <laughs> uh, so or a like, suitcase yeah or a suitcase that's in a closet <laughs> or under the bed or a god's eye yeah got all your god's yeah, eyes your god's in the eye, closet your god's eye that's dusty <laughs> 
your fiber art. <laughs> and, and I went to a high school where it was mixed, right? It was like 50-50, like Crow versus others. That's how crows would see it, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and and so whenever something cultural came up, like if 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 somebody walked into your class and said they're going to have a cultural event, 99.9% of crow people and even non-Indian people in that community would assume it's a crow Indian event like a dance or something not realizing that as i learned as i got older and i went to school and i educated myself and that everyone has culture the way the word is understood now to, to i mean is defined is that everyone has 100 percent of culture it's not it's not yeah. this thing that's fractional fractionalized it's all of us have 100 percent. so in selena's comment what janine said to her yeah that's 100 percent right um uh culture can't shrink or grow it is what it is now where where that as an organism where that where where culture can change and and fluctuate is each within that organism there's these little like like pie pieces i guess you can say but it's still 100 percent of it right so when when Selena made the comment about what Janine had said about culture culture not dying out, she's right. Culture doesn't die out, right? As long as humans move, culture exists. What I would say though is that how that evolution happens isn't natural. Um, the natural evolution of culture is completely warranted and it's accepted, and even from tribes all across the plains they accepted a natural evolution of culture right and and we we know that through oral history and that's called stratified narrative and you can see it in story right it's like each time that evolution happens it adds a new layer to the narrative of a people so yeah when this evolution happens unnaturally that means you have to mitigate it with an unnatural remedy because the natural remedy doesn't – it can't account for that. So yeah. so that's where I would argue, Selena, with Janine a little bit in a in the most respectful way possible. Um, <laughs> oh, I would tell her that she's right. 100% uh, – the culture of Crow people is not dying. But right. how that yeah. evolution happened is not natural and it's unsafe. Mm, yep. Interesting. Point. I agree with that for sure. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And I think what we got to, or what the point that I was trying to make that I, I was just titling wrong, is that there were loss of cultural practices, and those were because of how did you word that? Not un unnatural, un are very harmful ways. That's why they're they're being lost because of because of thing out outside sources coming into our culture and. Um, discouraging yeah. certain practices hey, or taking over. It, it, you're right, and that's where the the rom like it, to go back to an earlier podcast. That's where that romantic version of ourselves is dangerous because we as Indian people have replaced authentic forms of culture with things that are dressed up as culture, yeah. and because we only have the capacity to have 100 percent of culture. When that new thing comes in, it has to push something out or stamp it out. Yeah. It's like stuffing a fire too thick, right? It needs that to breathe. So people don't understand that even, even in some communities, they viewed other religious practices as harmful to culture, like the peyote religion. And I, I grew up uh, around it a little bit, and I, so I'm not going to dog it or anything. But I can see how people can say, well, that can come in. It's masked as something of your own, and it could it could hurt. So you can see that with other things. Uh, powwow can do that. It's masked as something that's authentically ours, and it could. So when these methodologies come into play in doing research, yeah. and and people mask mask them with medicine wheels and yeah. feathers and God's eyes and and uh, safety pin headdresses. Or they say, hey, this is the uh, cir talking circle and all these things. It, I, 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 
I'd like to think that those, even if they're meant well, that's still, it's dangerous to introduce new things like that, that can take off like a nap weed, you know, I'm done. Going on that, Aaron. Yes. Is uh, in one of our, in our ceremonies, there's, uh, there's the fork stick where you take coal for yeah. the smudge, for the smudge. But because sometimes we don't have our ceremonies in a teepee, we'll have it in a the house. There's no stove to make coals. So they use those uh, briquettes that the church uses. The Catholic now, coals. And I thought to myself, when did that come about? That just kind of infused its way in there. The word metonymy comes to mind when, when you think yeah. there's, there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for sweet pine or sweet grass or juniper, it's that. Whereas you look at the cross, that's, yeah. that's euphemism for the church, right? You you think Christianity, Jesus. Yeah. There's no replacement for those things. It's that. So in there, we we took out, the fork stick is still there, but we don't use it. We still sing the song, but we don't use it. Like, I remember it being used. So... That's kind of a kind of a, a real world practice that you know things are being phased out that way. Or uh, but you, but red, you see red, red wieners in the in the meal. I mean, when, when <laughs> and and a, and a and a boiled egg, boiled egg and chip. yeah. What's the, hey hey? On a side note, what's the deal with black feet in a boiled egg? Oh my That's God. a whole other podcast. Dude, everything you go to in Black Blackfoot country is red wieners and a boiled egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the food podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had this conversation uh, uh, previously before the this, we launched this podcast, but it's about the that uh, the thing Aaron was talking about about the you know we have one hundred percent of our culture. It's the practices and the traditions that die off, but there's always this. Um, there's always this uh, desire or this human endeavor to keep that cultural piece whole. So there's always something that comes in and replaces it. And what we were really curious and, and wondering about is what is that, what is that thing that drives, um, what is that thing that drives us to want to keep a piece of culture alive, or uh, I guess a piece of the, the practice alive, to a point where we um, evolve it to fit the modern day today. So um, I, I think about this in, in our deeds, you know, there's, there's great deeds accomplished, you know, by, by our, our young people and uh, uh, across Indian country. But we, I, I don't, uh, I see, and I see some of this um, uh, transformation of this, this thing we're talking about, about this song that's, that's narrating a deed and it's, it's praising a person, but what, what is, what have we replaced that with today for our, for our uh, native people? That's kind of where I'm hey, looking toward. Sean Dean, I don't mean to cut off, but Aaron's having some technical difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to just gonna roll with it till we get to the half point and then we'll get him back in. Oh, gotcha. Okay. He was talking too much anyway. <laughs> he kind of needed to shut up. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't have the rights to talk. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He didn't get the talking stick. <laughs> he talked. He talked out of turn. <laughs> didn't have the amulet. <laughs> oh, I think he's back. Are you back in, Aaron? Yeah, I'm back. All right. <laughs> you sounded kind of sad. Did you hear what we were saying yeah, about you? Back. <laughs> oh, he's still there, he Aaron. He's there. Well, I was Bro, here. are you there? Brosive. What? That's weird. I've never heard Shandin say bro. I know, huh? That was <laughs> funny. <laughs> he's like, he's like, bro. I'm like, whoa, dude. <laughs> I don't even really use that either. <laughs> so I, <don't... laughs> I was going for the shock factor. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's uh, maybe let's listen to this next song. We'll take a little break. Uh, we'll see if we can get uh, our technical difficulties figured out. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, so that uh, that particular song is a is a crazy dog, brave dog society song, and uh, we still use that today. But I was listening to it, and it was a choppy version, and the recording is a choppy. I was listening to a choppy version of a choppy version of that song. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but that's a uh, uh, that's part of our validation in our society. When you're a member of that society, you can sing that song. And if you were to sing it and you recognized it, we would know who you belong to and and uh, what what duties you have to your community. Hmm. And, and is this it's like black... you were saying, it's like a... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Is this a Blackfeet song that we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, black, a Blackfoot uh, society. Yeah. Brave dog, crazy dog. So you were saying it's kind of like a driver's license uh, and gives you a certain rights or certain responsibilities. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Mike? So, yeah. How, so you have to be transferred in to that society. So how yeah. I was transferred in is that they captured me and there's a specific capturing song they use, but the, the doorman would capture you. And they would bring you in. And when I got captured, I said, man, I got to get to town. I got a lot of things to do. They said, nope, you come in with us. So they sat me down in that teepee and and uh, that's, I was in. So my dad transferred me his rattle, who was transferred uh, by White Calf, James White Calf. Hmm. That's how he got his rattle. So... Uh, I was fortunate that my dad transferred me his rattle, so I was able to transfer in. And you're you're supposed to transfer in with your mate. It's kind of a even though it's a man society, your mate um, accompanies you. Yeah. And uh, in reality, the woman can override any decision in there if she wanted to. But hmm. even though it's a man society, that's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother podcast, but. Yeah. Again, that song was is our validation. Yeah. And uh yeah, yeah. We carry out our duties during the the, enca- the encampment of uh we were hired to kind of police the camp, make sure uh those reenactment stories, our origin stories are are reenacted correctly. So that's what our Brave hmm. Dog Society is about in the now time. Again, yeah. we're we're adapting to uh different different era of time there really hasn't been a lot of war before the gulf war uh, and there was a long stretch between vietnam and the gulf war where there was nothing happening at that time so now not a lot of people are involved in our ways but still those processes are still in place yeah Pretty interesting, yeah. So we, we we were we talked briefly about the idea of rights, you know, rights and rituals. Who who is allowed to do certain things? And uh, it sounds like you guys are, are fortunate enough to still have some of those things alive and well. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. in other communities, you know that um, that structure may or may not be there. So then it brings up this really strange um this strange uh uh occurrence where people will self proclaim themselves as being the ones to know <clears throat> and that's you know that's pretty pretty far outside of a of a tribal way of thinking to be self appointing yourself a, a a knower of things so mm-hmm. and and you see this in 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 academics you see it in native faculty who adhere to some of those values where the the pathway to promotion and success in in academics really requires a person to have a degree of self uh, the ability to self promote and um you know a lot of uh, a lot of folks just can't do that in 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 a way, you know, that leaves us behind some of our non-native colleagues in a way. But 
you know, I think there's something more and there's something uh, um, for us folks like that. It just hasn't been realized yet. And the tribal colleges are, are kind of leaning toward that, but, you know, not quite there yet. So this idea of rites and rituals and who who knows and who gets to do what is can be kind of a contentious uh, subject to talk about in certain communities. So any, any, uh, any thoughts on that from those here experiences with that? Somebody's typing. <laughs> Somebody's Googling it. What is my well, right? I guess no. since nobody wants... <laughs> Go ahead. Nobody does. Nobody want to talk. No, I couldn't hear yeah, what Sandeep said, but but I I got the gist of it. Well, this is what I'll say: is um, I know when doing research, um, there was a time where where I I in one instance where I was putting an excerpt into a research into a into my thesis. I think it was actually no 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 it was in a paper I was writing, and one of the reviewers read it and said. Hey, you should take this part out. It's needless. And it was the part of in the excerpt it, where it talks about where the information came from. So the so when I took the excerpt out, I added I put in the part when the person was speaking to me there and they said I heard this story from so and so who heard it from so and so. It was told at this time and they kind of gave some some uh uh food for thought in it. So I added that part into the excerpt and then they wanted that part out. And I thought if all research is done like that, it it makes me appear to be the expert if hmm. if we take if we take yeah. that part out. Yeah. And, and that's and that where goes, I that goes to the validation of who's defining that? Your committee, which is didn't have any uh knowledge of how let's say how you go fast. If you were to go out and fast and you got that knowledge, you came back and you got it validated to you uh, by, by another elder. Or they were, you were gifted something that somebody else, that somebody else had way back in history. That's valid in our way. In their way, it's, it's not pertinent because they don't know how that process happens. And that's the rub. That's the, the, the conflict between those two types of of research because if you go out in a blackfoot way you get prepared in a blackfoot way you're going to get blackfoot type of knowledge if you go out in a crow way or a kootenai way or a nez Perce way you're going to get that kind of knowledge or if you go to skc you're going to get the skc degree or u of m degree or a stanford degree those are the types of yeah of different ways to retrieve that. And they're all going to have different ways of how you, how they validate what research is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's just my view on that, on that. Seems to be true and seems to make sense. Yeah. So then again, uh, in, in our, our mission here to uh, realize what uh, an indigenous research methodology, you know, I don't know if we can make it match or meet every tribal need. So the, then the mm -hmm. challenge is, is how do we, how do we craft something that loosely fits everybody's, every different tribe's uh, individual research needs? Are, are we just, is it a pipe dream? What are, what are we up to here? You could take some denominators from each process. Yeah. And, and make it a framework. I don't know yeah. that, that's still you're you're cheating that process, but yeah. if you were to make a framework of some time of some type. Yeah, it seems it seems to you get you get kind of in dangerous water there, you know, when you start right. pulling from here and there, you know, especially in the in the spiritual sense like you talk about, you know, you mm -hmm. you start endangering your your own well being if you start meddling, you know. And I think you know what I mean in that, in that way. Right. So, yeah, I, yeah. And I just, I just don't know, you know, I just don't know. It's like going to a uh, Kentucky fried chicken and asking for a ribeye. They don't specialize in ribeyes. <laughs> you go to yeah. a ribeye place. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna <laughs> ribeye place and order a hot dog. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Unheard of. I'm called for. Yeah, it's blasphemy. It is. Well, I, I want to know what um, what anybody else thinks about this. Um, Kamii, Brenda, haven't heard from you yet. What's up? Oh, I'm just really listening. I um, don't think I have enough knowledge to have very much input on this. And so that's why I'm quiet. <laughs> well, what, what about your opinion? What do you, what is your opinion on it? My opinion on it? Well, just listening to you guys talk, I guess it really does just boil down to who does have the rights and who gives the rights and how do you about going about it? And so I guess that's just kind of where my mind is thinking on um, who has enough knowledge to do, to do that enough experience to do that, to pass it down. So I guess I'm just still trying to process that in a perspective. Yeah. In, in the Blackfoot thinking, no being is better than another being. Mm. So like the, 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 the animals that walk on the water or on the ground or the under the water or under the earth or in the air, and then human beings. Human beings are not better than in any of the animals. So they have to ask for permission. And through that mm. permission is the song. That song is the validation of permission. So in our belief, that, that song is very important. And if that song disappears from our culture, it'll still exist somewhere in the ether. But if it's not practiced that type of knowledge can't be gained or that kind of power can't be gained because the song is not there. Mm -hmm. I just, I did a study one time, just kind of an observation when I, after I went to school and I came back to my community, I sat down and I probably about 2016, 20 years ago, I just sat down and looked in my community who could sing a song without having any help or a recorder or would know someone's song or something song without having any help. And I made a list of all the elders. Then I made a list of all the middle age. Then I made a list of all the young people and then the really young people. Hmm. That list that of the elders, they're all gone except for maybe four. So that knowledge hmm. is almost gone mm -hmm. if, if somebody doesn't go out there and ask. And I think when, uh, Brenda, when you're saying, how do I, how do we get that? Or Selena, how do we get that? Mm -hmm. You have to go ask. And then those processes for Crow and processes, processes for Kootenai and Blackfoot are still there. You just have to exercise those processes mm -hmm. to get that particular knowledge. And then you can perpetuate it. Somebody will come and ask you for it later on. And that's, that's how we would do it as Blackfoot people. And it's still being used today. Uh, through that process of, and I think mm. crows too, uh, not, albeit not by everybody, but by a core core group that still perpetuates that belief. Yeah. Yeah, that and that's the tough one, I think, is, you know, locating those people, like-minded people, and then, um, you know, getting the accurate information out to, to those that uh, would embody that um, but yeah, yeah, you know, what, what is that? That's, that's a really good. That's a really good one there is when you think about that. I think that's a good, like a test of where, a where a tribal group is, is, you know, who, like you said, who can sing a song, very traditional song that has a very specific purpose without any help knows the, the processes and the protocols. That's a, I think that's a really good test of where uh, a person might be. And it might really give us an avenue to say, okay, this is, if, if, um, if this is really important, if the songs are really important to, to anything tribal in a community, how can we use the vehicle of research then to um propagate that or to disseminate that into mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. that's that's a that's a tough one because you have to have open-minded people to say you know yeah i want to know how do i do this yeah and sometimes the block the the major block that i see sometimes is somebody saying 
oh, you know, you're not right. This is that's mm-hmm. not the way we do it because this is what so and so said, uh-huh. even if they're wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, then 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 you get in this battle of who's more right, or you know what who's more traditional in in their approach. And I don't know if you see that I, in, in other communities. Mm-hmm. I've struggled. I struggled with that with that process of oh, you're doing it wrong, or that's yeah. not how it's done. But what I've boiled it down to is the transfer process itself of having a venue, having action, having language, and having song. Yeah. No matter what is being done, is if you followed that process, that's what I think is is a Blackfoot thing, is mm. if you followed that yeah. process. And yeah. that's how you would get the knowledge transferred to you. And it may be different for the same types of things, but as long as you followed that pro- pro- protocol – it's uh, yeah. valid. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that holding pretty true for a lot of different communities, you know, that those things mm-hmm. would be necessary. And, um, you know, at the different stages of, of uh, you know, traditions coming and going, you know, different communities are at certain stages. So really focusing on those core areas to, you know, lift your community up so you can make it function again in the way it's supposed to seems to be pretty important. Uh, what What do you got? What do you guys see down in in Crow as far as that's concerned? Do you see that that same phenomenon occurring? Selena, Marty, or Aaron, go get on it. I uh, get in, on in it in regards to what aspect? It's well, you know, like you know, so tradi- loss of tradition. And really uh, having something that can give you a good test on where you're at and what are the needs to help bring certain things back. So like Mike was talking about the venue, the song, the language and action. And then also, you know, looking in the community to see who knows particular things and at what age are they. And and do you encounter this pushback where somebody says, you're you're not right. That's not right. That's not the way we do it. Yes, a hundred percent. I think that's what that's <laughs> that's where that hesitation comes to even speak on it because yeah. if you're not right, you'll you'll be corrected. But I do appreciate what Mike said about to making he didn't say making mistakes, but doing it wrong and being corrected because really that's the only way you learn. Yeah, and I was thinking about that mm-hmm. in, in just in the research process. Like that's exactly how I learned to do my research. Right, I I went and tried to do it. And if I was wrong, somebody corrected me and I don't, and I, and I wasn't afraid to do it wrong. So I wonder why we're so hesitant to do, well, I shouldn't say, I wonder why I think we're more hesitant to do that with our own cultural practices because, because of, because if we do it wrong, like just all of the other things that go along with it, like we're (laughs) sometimes we're known for doing it wrong for the rest of our lives, you know, Oh yeah, she's the one that, you know, (laughs) did whatever. (laughs) She's always screwing up. (laughs) I think a lot of that comes from the notion of these ways are really powerful. And if you have, if if you don't do it correct, you can hurt somebody. Mm-hmm. yourself your yeah. family or somebody else so that notion of you be careful what you say you can hurt somebody mm-hmm. you be careful what you do think of your children so that's why it, yeah. it's so important that we do those things correctly and because a lot of our generations have been removed they understand that so they look yeah. at it from afar and say those are powerful i better not mess with that yeah i better not mess around yeah. with that stuff and as a result, we just they stay away. I must. I'm just assuming that's what some people do. But that's a good question. Of why are we not involved in that collective of what it means to be Salish, or the yeah. collective of what it means to be Kootenai or Crow or Blackfoot or, however. Yeah. Yeah. What was you going to say, Aaron? I would say that right now, Crow. Crow as a cultural community is going through um, quite a change in the sense that there's some uh, ignorance, but there's still a community of people that are pretty aware of like cultural loss. Maybe a better word is like cultural substitution, right? We're subbing other things 
and replacing yeah, yeah. crow belief with other things and uh, some of which is detrimental. But what I would tell you is um, I was told this quite a, quite a long time ago was, um, you know, when you can take a baby and you can hug it and you can hug it so much, you can kill it. And yeah. mm-hmm. the way I see crow people today is we live in a world where we think we're loving something so much, but really what we're doing is stamping it out. Uh, hmm. And that's what I see because um, really once you get past the surface of crow belief and culture, you realize the numbers are very, very low, very mm. low yeah. in mm. terms of what, who really knows crow things and who knows un, un, um, I don't know what the word is like, um, things that are unchanged, like the crow, even the crow creation store. If you're just to go and ask most crows uh, over the age of 30 or 40 can tell you kind of a variation of it. But there's probably only three people that can really tell you that story, you know, and that to hmm. me, like there, there, there's something to be saluted there that a very large number of people can tell you aspects of it, like a lot. Right. But then yeah. at the same time, it's like, it's an abridged version of, and so our entire culture now has become abridged. Yeah. You know, and, uh-huh. and it's simply, simply things like, um, like, uh, uh, I got a bumper sticker, uh, for being part of this language thing. And it says, and that means I love the crow language, but crows don't speak that way. So we, we use mm. the term biluga to describe ourselves. Now, when you say biluga, it means a whole different thing. It means our side. So it's an inclusive thing. It's, it's like, it, it, it's a group. There's a whole different conceptual idea to what biluga is versus what Apsaloga is, you know? Yeah. So um, simply that by replacing that. Another thing is the crow term for God. Most crows now will tell you, eat uh, a bark dia, right? Yep. Which is, it means like the one who does, but that's a very new term. Hmm. Um, the the crow word is Egypt Balia, and that means the one who the original worker are the one who worked first, which goes back to using your hands, working with your hands, which is directly related to the crow creation story. So there's like conceptual ideas that keep ideology alive, they keep worldview alive, and simple, simple terms. But by changing those terms. You, you unknowingly hurt things like what mm. Mike was saying, be careful what you say, you know? And so when we say, man, I would never tell any crow that they're wrong for using that word. Yeah. But they have to understand that that word um, encompasses a whole different worldview. Huh. Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting. Well, you know, it really sounds like there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really educate our own communities and um, man, how do you do that? And, and, you know, the way, the Mike, the way, the way you're, you're, you're characterizing your community, it sounds like, you know, you guys have a pretty good solid core of people that are re- really in tune to what needs to be done in the correct way. And man, it, it'd be, it'd be something to learn about the process of, uh, of how that, was maintained or how that was revived, you know, that would be re- really interesting to know how that uh, process worked. But, um, well, yeah, go ahead. Are we, are we done? Are we done? <laughs> I thought, it sounded like you were going <laughs> to cut me off. Like it sounded like you were going to do that. Like you don't have to go home, but you can stay here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. About yeah, that guy. You gotta, that, that was singing great. that happy trail song. Yeah. That don't was either. great, Aaron. <laughs> that was great. That what you just said, but uh, it's weird. To, it's weird. This whole, this podcast today seems to kind of have like a somber vibe to it. So we got to like, we got to like, it's heavy. Spice it up. It's, we got to spice it up a bit, guys. Spice. It's heavy. Spice. Well, it's, it's heavy, you, man. It's deep stuff. Sean you know? Dean. Sean Dean, when yeah. you want to close out everything, just start playing closing time and we'll just fade out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Shut up. We're leaving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean Dean will yeah. just turn the lights on when it's time to be done. No, this, this is, this is, I think we're getting into the meat of some things, you know, and, and, uh, 
it, it the lightheartedness the lightheartedness of it kind of goes goes to the to the wayside because it's it's interesting and to know that we're all kind of have our own little struggles with it but um yeah how yeah. do you spice it up how do you spice it up man I don't know, but I was just thinking about this. In my time living on the Flathead Res, uh, which has been quite a while now, I've seen a revitalization of culture in the right direction among a very small group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where I've seen I've seen the loss of elders, I've seen the loss of language, but I've also seen the loss of antiquated ideas too. And I've yeah. seen the loss of of old pedagogies that serve no purpose i've seen that die out and i've seen a growth although albeit small but of of culturally competent tribal people like people who identify themselves as bitterroot salish or pondere it's this flathead idea is dying mm -hmm. out um yeah and it's cool to see it's cool to see and for some reason in my observation here the Kootenai people have did a in years past. They kind of seem to hold on to that pretty good, and I don't know if that had to do with proximity to the church or or what, but it did seem that way from an outsider looking in. But it's really neat to see a small group of people starting to move in the right direction. So in in my time being here, I've seen I've I've seen the coffee dance, I've seen the scalp dance, I've seen. I've seen um, that old style day where it's 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 uh, an effort to bring the war dance back, the traditional Salish war dance. Where years past, it, it was this gen it was generic and it was there was a lot of hurdles and pitfalls and political notions of people like factions. Where now it just seems like people have the the right idea and they're taking the right steps. But like anything, we'd like them to, to take bigger steps in, in faster time. But yeah, but we got to be patient with things like this, and we got to yeah. get people to believe in a thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool to see it, at least that. So where I would say, yeah, we see loss of culture in other reservations, but there's these pockets, man, that are pretty impressive. It's impressive to be if for someone to be culturally competent culturally capable in a time that doesn't allow it really there's no yeah. time for it so yeah. um and i think what happened in in blackfoot country in in my time observing there too in where it was 20 30 years ago 20 years ago that core group of people just stayed with it they stayed with yeah. it and so if that's any prediction to what could happen here man you guys it, it's gonna get good you know it's gonna get yeah nice and so yeah, they, they beat it out of us back then. We could probably beat it back in somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah. the time. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Start forcing people to grow their hair. Yeah. Whip people e for e talking e English. <laughs> dude, e dude, e everyone's Indian till the rocks are hot, you know? <laughs> Yeah. No, this has been. A, I I think. What did you say? Oh, I was just gonna try to get a get a word in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here you go. Do it, man. Do it. You're there. Okay. Let me gather my batter box. Uh, go. Okay. I feel under pressure now. But I, uh, <laughs> go. Go. You're on. Okay. Well. Hot mic. To try to keep the. Well, oh, this is what I was gonna say. Here we go. Take two. It's all coming back to me. Hang on. Okay. We're holding. Okay. Now I got it. Holding pattern. All right. All right. Well, just, I agree with you guys that it's kind of hard, a hard subject to uh, keep lighthearted because it's, it pretty much challenges us. Like, you know, you have to really look at who you are as a person, who you are as an indigenous person, even who you are um, as a member of your tribe. But, um, I, I hate to go back way back into our conversation earlier, um, but I did want to talk about how um, cultures, our cultures are under an evolution. They're under change, whether it be forced or not forced or natural or unnatural. And um, when we talk to our elders, 
um, sure, we do need to perpetuate. We do need to preserve and and uh, bring back culture and aspects of our culture. And we get that information from our elders and our cultural experts. But I think, and I've I've come across this in my research, but I I'm being a bad academic now and not being able to tell you where I saw it or who I heard it from. But um, there is an importance to ask our elders and ask those cultural experts about the future and about their ideas of how our culture will look in the future. So um, I think hearing all this discussion today and trying to be a part of it, which we kind of discussed before, it's a pretty hard thing. Um, but um, I think that's one acknowledgement that we should make is cultures change and and we should ask elders and cultural experts about what they think our culture will be changing into in the future. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Agreed. Agreed. No. Kamiya, you got anything for us? She's still here. Kamiya. 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 Maybe oh, she went Kamiya. to get something to eat. Kamiya. Kamiya. <laughs> she had to step out in the chat. It says she had to step out. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. oh sure. She knew she was going to get called on. <laughs> and so she took off. Sure. Well, you know, I think we've reached the end of, of this. I don't know. I mean, we could talk more. We could keep going. But, you know, one, one thing I know that, um, that I like to get to is, is, uh, is solutions is real steps forward. I think we can talk about it, you know, day and night, but you know, what, what are some of the steps that we can take that will advance us forward? And that's, um, I'm, I'm hoping that's something every, everyone else is thinking. So, you know, just, just real quickly, anybody have any solutions? What are some solutions? What do we do? Go solutions, hit it. Everybody left too. Everybody's gone. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do we do? I don't do? know if I have a solution, but I think where we start is this, where we just talk about what are what are our hesitations, what are the connections, what are things that are already being practiced that that work, and what doesn't, and we just keep talking about it. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. No, that's a good one, and and I think we have to be unafraid to challenge what what's fed to us. Mm, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of material out there that people are producing, and it's infiltrating into things that are deemed indigenous. And whether we agree or disagree, I think we have to be able to be brave enough to say we disagree or we agree. But I think the next step for really on the ground natives, you know, working hard in our communities on the res or, or communities in, in urban environments is is start starting to get this, these ideas out there in whatever format we can. So so we can get some validation, as Mike talked about, to, to validate from our community, to to have some accountability to to know that what we're saying is right or whether it's wrong and be able to have the humility to say, yeah, OK, I, I see how I'm wrong and what can we do next? So I think those are some some of the things I think about. They're not solutions, but I think the talk about it, continuing to talk and advance forward is pretty important. Anybody have anything else? I agree with you on the talking part. I feel like the more people are open to talking about it, the more willing they are to participate in it. And I think right now with this day and age, not that many people, I feel like they're too preoccupied with other things, you know, and they're not making their culture a priority and they're not getting involved and they're not learning these things. And so I feel like if people keep on talking about it, it sparks an interest and when that happens, you know, they, they might want to reach out. So I just feel like the more we talk about it, the more people start to think about it. So that's yeah, kind of what my thoughts on it. And it's kind of hard. Yeah. It's kind of embarrassing to be able to be like, 
I don't know, <laughs> you know, or like, I don't know enough knowledge on it, you know, and it kind of puts you in a reality check of like where you sit within, you know, so it's just, um, I'm glad I'm thinking well, about think, these things. I think it's what, what you do after you say, I don't know. Mm, true. True. That's the important yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just, do you just keep saying it or do you do something about it? You know, true that. Yeah. Get in the know. I would, I I would say like, you know, I don't think it's our job to tell people to be more cultural or to be more Indian, I guess. But what I would tell people is if, if you're, if that's what you're choosing is not to be part of the movement of revitalizing culture and worldview is don't be in the way. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's weird. Cause we live in a weird time where like Indian people, there are Indian people who actively get in the way of cultural progress. Mm-hmm. So, and that's fine. That's, that's their right. They can do that. But I would say if that's the route you want to go, don't, but don't get in the way of anyone else. I guess that's choosing that mm-hmm. way. And another thing that I always get worried about with Indian people, because I've done it myself is don't replace the preservation of culture and identity with another movement thinking it is that yeah. and and i see that with activism and mm. i see that with mm-hmm. other other things not to say that that's bad but what i would tell you what i would advise young people that are growing in culture is it's real easy to cross the line and become more of a social justice warrior and then you'll sacrifice time learning the very thing you're trying to protect oh yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and, and I've seen that before, and I did it. You know, I, I I'm a vic. I get, I kind of like unknowingly did that. You know, and you, huh. you get you're like into the movement, and you just kind of into being punk rock, and like, and then you don't, you realize like, <laughs> all that time I could have yeah. been growing, and then I would have been more suited to address those problems. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So, so I would, I would be careful with that. Um, take things in time and be okay with being wrong you know mm-hmm. you're gonna be wrong you're gonna fail and that's cool yeah yeah that's the that's i think one of the keys don't be afraid to be wrong be vulnerable that's the only way mm-hmm. well let's wrap this up man we've been at it with the technical difficulties <laughs> and everything taken into account the heaviness you know i feel like i I feel like I had the talking stick for way too long. <laughs> I know. So, uh, I'm, so <laughs> I'm ready to be done now. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's be done. Mm-hmm. So we thank Mike again for joining us for these two uh, episodes and all the the knowledge that he's uh, been willing to share. And hopefully we can have him back on again uh, sometime after maybe he finishes his research and he can let us know uh, some of the things that he found. So again, thank you all, and we'll uh, see you soon. Thank you for joining us on this episode. And to learn more, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at IRCSKC. You can find us also on Facebook and YouTube by searching SKC Indigenous Research Center. You can also visit our website at IRC. Dot skc.edu. Don't forget to join us next time as we continue our discussions on Indigenous research, Indigenous research methodologies, and Indigenous worldviews. views.